Now you can tell we've been at this for a while because the first weeks that we were gathering, the sun was out when we started the lesson. And it's not cloudy outside, but the sun is gone. So winter quickly makes its way into our lives. Welcome to the sixth of our sessions on discovering Christ. Today, the topic is about the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been coming up to this. We began our sessions by asking some serious questions about our purpose in life, and we talked about God the Creator God at that point, in part because that's where we really begin to understand who we are, is by understanding that we are made by God, that we are made by God in God's image, and that we are made by God for a specific purpose in life. So that it's that quest for finding out what that purpose in life is, that is probably the greatest motivation for us to seek out Christ, to try to discover who Christ is and what Christ can be for us. So that's where we started. And then we talked a little bit about who Jesus was, just from a more objective point of view, from an historical point of view. And then we went a little bit into our faith documents, the scriptures, to discover a little bit about what Jesus said about himself. And we talked about how those documents themselves, even though they are documents of the church, um, there's a lot about them there that says that they are fairly reliable perhaps not in a scientific historical way, but in a way that tells a story that relates to us certain truths. That truth isn't always about scientific fact. Sometimes truth is even deeper. The facts point to truth. And so that's part of what we've been looking at. And then we talked about why we need a savior, which goes back a little bit and starts to look at both who Jesus was and why we have, want a relationship with Jesus and what Jesus did for us in terms of what we understand in the Christian faith as the death and, res the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we turned our attention then to that very fact. Why is the resurrection important? And then we want to now turn our... Uh, attention to a little different topic, and that's one that probably isn't uh, too comfortable for us as Episcopalians, quite frankly, uh, nor for a lot of people. The issue of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit, and we have a hard time putting our arms around what the Holy Spirit really is. Now, there are large branches of the Christian tradition that call themselves spirit-filled churches. I don't think we're any less spirit-filled. We just perhaps have a little bit more of a difficulty in terms of articulating what we understand the Holy Spirit to be. Uh, sometimes I remember my dad a long, long time ago calling those churches the churches of the Holy Rollers. You might have heard that term. Uh, and often it wasn't, a, it wasn't really meant to be a pejorative term, but it was a descriptive term. That often people who have a very heavy emphasis on the Holy Spirit have a very lively way of expressing their faith. And in fact, there is a branch of the church that is called Pentecostal. And often in the Pentecostal tradition, the role of the Holy Spirit is deeply deeply identified, and in fact it is the work of the Holy Spirit and the movement of the Holy Spirit that becomes the very substance of what they are about as a group, as a family, as a denomination. And so that's going to be our topic tonight. Who is the Holy Spirit and what does that have to do with me? I want to begin with a scripture passage which talks about the Spirit 
from the very beginning, because many times people think about the Holy Spirit as a New Testament phenomenon, as somehow it has to do with uh, after Jesus' resurrection and the coming of Pentecost and so on, and so it's sort of a phase three of God. But the scriptures tell us a different story, because if we go back to the very beginning of scripture, to the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, we hear these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That's from the very, very first words of the book of Genesis, our understanding of creation, of how what we know in this world came into being. And the writer of the book of Genesis is telling us already that the Spirit of God was present at the very beginning of time. In the second chapter of Genesis, we hear yet again another important passage. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now those two realities, the Spirit of God that moved over to waters and the breath that goes into this, to this clump of clay, they are the same thing. And in fact, in the Hebrew in which these books were written, it is the same word, and the word is ruach, it is the breath of God. So we have the breath of God over the chaos of the waters before anything had been ordered in creation. And now the breath of God is what's going into this clump of earth and making Adam live, making the first human being alive. Now that's at the very beginning. Now later on in the scriptures, after Israel had been in exile and was to return to the promised land, we hear from the prophet Ezekiel. You may know this story too. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. You know the story of the dry bones in the valley. Yes. Remember, you know, that's very dramatic when Cecil B. DeMille or somebody gets hold of it and you see all of the rattling bones come together. But it's really the, the focus of the scripture passage is not about the drama of the bones coming together, but the very promise that God will make breath enter them so it becomes very clear to us that it is the breath that is the sign of life, and particularly of God's creative life. Now, a little on, further on in the same passage, we hear, then he said to me, meaning Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So there we go again with that term, breath. So it is breath that is the very 
in image of the Spirit of God. As I mentioned, the Hebrew word ruach is often translated into Greek as pneuma. Pneuma, we get the word pneumatic. How many people have pneumatic tools? Have you ever used pneumatic tools? Those tools are, are, are pressured by what? Are, are, are driven by what? Air. air. Pressured air. When we get pneumonia, what is it? It's a disease of the lungs that takes our breath away. So that, again, ruach, pneuma, and then it is translated into Latin as spiritus. So when we talk about spirit, we talk about spiritus, we're talking about the very breath of God. And so that's, that's what the Holy Spirit is going to be about for us. We're going to have to think about the breath. And so we're going to do something for our prayer today. Now the folks who were able to come and join us on Sunday have had a preview of this. What I'm going to ask you to do, because you're all nice and comfy and leaning every which way in your chairs, I'm going to be the, the school marm for a moment and tell you to sit up straight. <laughs> no matter where you are, don't bother looking at me or at the, at, at the, um, at the, at the board. You just need to sit up straight, feet flat on the floor. Feet flat on the floor. And think that there's a little hook in the very tippy top of your head. And somebody has a little cord there and they're going to pull on it to make you sit as upright as you can. Put your hands on your knees. And what I want you to do is take a deep breath out and not breathe in until I say breathe in. We're going to breathe in to a count of five. Breathe in one, two, three, four, five. And out one, two, three, four, five. And in one, two, three, four, five. Now close your eyes. Out, one, two, three, four, five. And in, one, two, three, four, five. And out, four, five. And in, Three, five, and out, two, four, five, and in, and out. Now continue to breathe that way. And before you know it, you'll begin to realize that you're not thinking about anything else. You're only thinking about breathing. Keep breathing slowly in, slowly out. And before you know it, you'll see yourself relaxing. Imagine all of the tension leaving your body. Don't think about what was before or is yet to come. Just think about breathing, breathing, breathe. This is prayer. This is the Spirit of God entering our lungs like it did that first human being, making us alive. This is the Spirit of God coming into our life, making us alive like it did those dry bones. This is the very presence of God in our midst, right here and right now. Now 
Turn your palms up, but keep them on your lap. Because now we are in a position, a posture of receiving. Receive the gift of God. Receive the Spirit of God. And our singing today is going to be without accompaniment. It's going to be in Latin. But it's very simple. It's from the form of a Tze chant. The words are Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes gentes, alleluia. If you need to look, you can look at the screen, but they're easy to follow. I'll start singing, and then you just join in as you feel comfortable. Just keep breathing, though. Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes gentes, alleluia. 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 Women only. Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia. Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia. All the men. Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia, Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia, full breath everyone, Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia, Laudate Dominum, Laudate Dominum, Omnes Gentes, Alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Kindle within us the fire of your love. Amen. How do you feel? Different. Just all of a sudden... Everything seems okay. And that's what the Spirit of God can do to us. Because you see, when we seek Christ, 
the gift of God to us is the Holy Spirit. And so we need to ask this question, who is this Holy Spirit and just what does that have to do with me? We are Christians who believe in the mainstream of Christian doctrine and we believe that God is revealed to us, the love of God rather, is revealed to us in a trinity of persons. That's that marvelous mystery we often talk about, how there is just one God, but there are three persons. That's, it's beyond explanation. We can try to explain it. We can try to wrap our minds around it. We can name different pieces, perhaps, that we think, but then we begin to go back to the original piece and we realize that the doctrine itself of the Trinity says it isn't that God is in three parts, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but rather it's all in all that God the Father, whenever God the Father thinks, does, loves, acts, the Son is thinking, doing, loving, acting. The Spirit is thinking, doing, loving, acting. Whenever the Spirit thinks or acts, the Father is doing this, and so the Son, and so on. Probably the closest thing that we could come to that in, a physical, in the physical world today would be what we call a hologram. For those of us who under stand those kinds of things. You ever, have you, if you've ever been to Disney World, that was one of the coolest things I've ever seen, was to go when, this is way, way, way back, you know, when Epcot first opened. That's the last time I was there, so it's much bigger now, but you went into that big uh, spherical, that first building that you went in, and one of the things they had there were holograms. They had, remember, I don't know if you remember this, if you were there, there were holograms of Stone Age people and they looked like real people. And you could walk around them and you would see different, it wasn't like it was just one, one uh, two-dimensional face and it kept following you around. It, it, you could actually stand behind them and see their rear end, you know, that, that kind of thing. So you could see the back of their head, their shoulder, their arm. If they move their arm, you could see it from the bottom or the top. It was a marvelous thing to me that you could do that. I never understood it until somebody said, well, it's all done with lasers, and they started explaining how all this happens. But one of the marvelous things, once you kind of get into all of this, is that a hologram is a, an interesting phenomenon because you can take a hologram and if you divide it, you don't have only half of what you had before. So if, say, if, say I'm a hologram, I'm not really here. And so in that sense, I'm a figment of your imagination or a trick of using light to fool your senses into thinking that there's a real human being standing in front of you talking at you. Well, if you would take, say, something and be able to like cut part of me away, you wouldn't see like the head over here and the rest of me over here. You would see all of me over here and all of me over here. That's how holograms work. See, so you don't when you divide a hologram, the intensity goes down a little bit because you're dividing up the intensity of the light, but the entire feature is divided. That's kind of the way the Trinity works. If you think about it for a minute. You know, St. Patrick had the shamrock, you know, had three leaves, and I mean, that, that's why the shamrock is the picture or the image, the icon of, uh, St. Patrick, because they use that to explain the Trinity. You know, how you could have three leaves, but it's still, you, you take one leaf off, it's not a shamrock anymore. You know, that, that sort of thing. Well, but you still can take it apart. So it lim that limps. With a hologram, it's even more sophisticated, so it's even more hard to take apart. So it's probably a little closer to the image of the Trinity than even St. Patrick's shamrock. I remember as a kid being in the, uh, in the grass and picking up something and saying, I got a shamrock. And my mother said, no, that's clover. <laughs> <laughs> and usually it had four leaves on it, but once in a while you'd see one to three, and all she said, well, probably the lamb ate one of the leaves off, you know, it's, it's <laughs> one, one of those kinds of things. But, but the Trinity is that, that mysterious 
way of thinking for Christians that says we have only one God, but we have three persons. Now that's hard for us because in part, it's a problem of language. Because the word person in the ancient language of the theological discourse of the time did not mean person the way you and I mean it today. It was more meant like a mask. And so it was like, you almost can name the person of the Trinity by what is happening and what is going on. So that's one way of looking at it, that we see the Father in the creative love of God. That the creative love of God that brought the universe into being, that brought us into being, and gave us that purpose that we're searching for, that that was the love of God that did that, and that is the Father at work. And then there is the saving love of God. And we talked about why we need a savior and that that savior was Jesus, the son. But again, remember we talked about the son being the spitting image of the father, a chip off the old block, however you wanted to describe it. Well, that's so, that relation is so close that as even the son was dying for us, it was God that was doing it. It was God that was doing it. So the love of the Father that made us is also the love that redeems us and makes us whole again. And then it is the empowering love of God that is the work of the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit gives life to the world at the beginning of creation, as the Spirit gives life puts life into that clump of clay that we call Adam, the first human beings. As the Spirit puts life into the dead bones in the the Kidron Valley, that is the empowering work of the Spirit, so that the Spirit gives life. Where the Spirit is, there is life. We just did a little breathing exercise, a little relaxing exercise. Think of that then when we go to prayer, that if we do that to ourselves when we pray, we are praying in the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the breath of life. Now, if we go back to the Old Testament, it seems that that was given only to a chosen few. It was given to, uh, well, other than the creative spirit that went into the breath, the breath that went into the clump, lump of clay and made human beings, but this other kind of empowering spirit to do greater and bigger things. We only see, you know, with the the judges, the leaders of God's people, or Moses. Love to say that Moses. Just like, uh, who who was, who, uh, Charlton, who played opposite Charlton Heston in Cecil B. DeMille? Is that Olivia de Havilland? You know who I'm talking about. No, 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 that was Joel Brenner, but that was, but the, the, the love interest. She, she used to say Moses, the way, the way that she said that name, Moses. So I always say his name that way, and when I teach Old Testament, I end up saying it that way, and all the students run around going, Moses. <laughs> <clears throat> but Moses was seen to be the one who had a portion of God's spirit. And in fact, when Moses goes to God and Moses asks for help, that's what, exactly what God says. Take a portion of the Spirit and give it to the 70 elders. So it's always about empowering the leadership among the people of God. So other than just the the life force that flows through the people of God, when we're talking about that empowering Spirit over and above the life force, then it seems to be only a few who are chosen in the Old Testament. We see that then in... Again, in Ezekiel, later on, when he's talking about restoring Israel to their promised land, the nation of Israel to their promised land, a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to follow my ordinances. So again, it's all about keeping the rules, it's all about the leadership of God's people, 
it's, uh, it's sort of, in the Old Testament at least, uh, we, we get this idea that it's, you know, it's not for everybody. It's, it's for those specially chosen by God to lead God's people forward. But then we get Jesus. We get a whole different view of the Spirit. In fact, it is Jesus that baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Take the scriptures, the Gospels. Matthew 3.11, I baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist speaking. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's a whole different viewpoint going on there. The Gospel of Mark, first chapter, eighth verse. Same thing, John the baptizer speaking again. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.16, not John 3.16, but Luke 3.16. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy even to untie his sandals, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Same thing all over again. And then finally, we get a John 1st chapter, 33rd verse, where again, where Jesus is being pointed out as the Spirit descending on him, the Spirit of God being with Jesus, and then Acts, the book of Acts 1-5, we hear about the Spirit now coming upon whom? But the disciples. So all of a sudden, we have this um, de de democratization, if you will, of the Spirit. It isn't the special purview of a chosen few, but rather because of what Jesus has done, it's now become something which we all, if we belong to Jesus, we have the capacity to see and feel and experience the Holy Spirit among us. What is the job of the Holy Spirit? The job of the Holy Spirit is simply to reveal God's love for you. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, to reveal God's love for you. Romans, the fifth chapter, the fifth verse, St. Paul says, For the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who he has given to us. So no longer is it just for the chosen few, but now it is for anyone, for anyone who puts their faith in the person of Jesus Christ, who has this relationship with God in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit to create life. That's what it did at the beginning of time. It created the world. It put life into, Adam, into Adam's, you know, that lump of clay we called Hadam, the first man. It was the breath of God, the spirit of God that was able to breathe life into dead bones. Now that same Holy Spirit comes to us. We have the capacity to plug ourselves into that Holy Spirit. Now that's, that's a pretty big thing. Why aren't more Christians transformed by the Holy Spirit? Hmm? That's a good question. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Because the Holy Spirit is pretty big stuff. We know the story of Pentecost. We could tell that story again. Pentecost itself begins a revolutionary movement that radically impacts the world. Now, what is a revolutionary movement? Let's talk about that for a minute. What is the purpose of a revolution? Change. Change. Now, sociologists will say it's a social movement that advances the competing, uh, the exclusive competing claims to control of something. Think about it. Yes, David. Are you thinking? 
<laughs> I got a headache. Okay. A revolution tries to take something that is in control and say it is no longer in control. That's what a revolution does. Think about it. So if Pentecost begins a revolutionary movement, Pentecost begins something that is going to change the very nature of the world that we know. How many of you know the song, The End of the World as We Know It? Now that's, I know, that's not an oldster song. That's sort of my 1980s kind of, it's the end of the world as we know it. Yeah, we've got people too young and people too old in the middle. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what's going on here. At Pentecost, the announcement is being made, the world you know now is ending. It is now God's time. It is now God's time. But the problem with revolutions is what? It's not easy. People suffer. People die. It's hard work to change. I've already told the joke here, haven't I? How many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Maybe, maybe it's that very thing why it's so hard for us to talk about the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's that very thing that makes it so hard for us to realize the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Because the minute we recognize the Spirit, the minute we acknowledge the Spirit, we are opening the door to massive change opening the door to massive change. Think about it. That the world, as the world orders itself, is no longer de destined to be there. That it is God's will that the world be different. That's what revolution is about. Now, it says in this little thing, Pentecost begins a revolutionary movement that radically impacts the world. I'm going to do a little word play again. Radical. How many radicals do we have in this room? <laughs> a few willing to put up their hand. Well, let's, let's, well, no, we're not talking politics. See, we're not talking politics. All of you should be radicals. Let me tell you something. What, where does the word radical come from? That's, that's what I want to talk about for a minute. The Latin word from which radical comes is radix, R-A-D-I-X, radix. What does that mean? The root. The root, like of a, you know, a carrot or a, of a flower or the root. That's all it is. It means the root. But to become radical means to be changing it, not just superficially on the top, but deep down at the roots, so that what comes up is something totally different. So when we say that Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit upon the world, begins a revolutionary movement that radically impacts the world, we're saying that God's kingdom is trying to reach down into the very roots of the way the world is and change it there. It's not just kind of smoothing things over. It's not just kind of making nice with everything. But actually trying to, and we even say things like, we're going to root out evil. How do you get rid of a dandelion? You don't just chop off the flower. You got to dig down and rip out that root. Well, that's what we're talking about here, that Pentecost came, and as a result of Pentecost, as a result of the coming of God's Holy Spirit upon humanity, we are saying that it is possible, and in fact, it is the will of God that we begin to root out evil 
injustice, a lack of integrity, anything that we want to talk about in terms of what the fruits of the Spirit are, the positive dimensions. What are the fruits? In order to get those fruits, you've got to have good roots. Remember we had an image a couple of sessions ago. If you want to, have, you want to harvest apples, you don't plant a peach pit. Well, if you want kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, respect, dignity, all of those kinds of things that we all say that we want in our society, you don't do it by simply moving the fruit around on the tree. What do you have to do? You have to make sure you plant the right seeds and that the right roots are growing there and that the roots are healthy. And that's the work of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. Now, how? Why do we know that? There are certain promises that are given to us in the scriptures. If we believe that the scriptures are right and true, and that they, guide, they are a guide for life, that's what we profess as believing Anglicans and Episcopalians, that in Luke 24, 49, we are promised that the Holy Spirit will empower us to live a life that is rooted in Christ. The more we become like Christ, our roots become more like those of Christ. Luke 24 says, And see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised, so stay here in the city. This is at the end of Luke's Gospel. Until you have been clothed with power from on high. What is that power? The Holy Spirit. And then Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Another thing that the, the Holy Spirit promises us is to reveal God's personal love for us. Romans 5, 5, we've seen that one already. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out of our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And then in Galatians, Paul says, and because you are children of God, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts and it makes us cry out, Abba, Abba, which is uh, Father. Daddy. It's not even father, it's daddy. We are so familiar with God and God loves us so we can call him daddy. When we say the Lord's Prayer, that's the word Jesus uses. Abba. Father. Daddy. That intimacy with God. That's what the Holy Spirit promises us. Well, that sounds good, Father, but why do we have such a hard time with this? And why do so many people who profess to be Christians kind of not get into this? And why is it that we have so many believing or at least professing Christians in the world and the world is still the way it is? You would think with all these, you know, billion, about a billion people who profess some form of Christianity or another, that we would be able to change this world of ours to be something very different than we experience. But maybe it's the way that we've gotten comfortable with our religion, and maybe that's what needs to happen. If we're going to have a radical change, what do you need to do when you're feeding the roots? You've got to get the fertilizer deep down inside. Favorite parable of mine from from, this, uh, from Luke's Gospel, when Jesus is going to Jerusalem and he goes by a, and, he, and, and, he, and he talks about a, a, a fig tree. And he tells the story about a farmer who looks at the fig tree, there's no fruit on the fig tree. He tells the gardener, get rid of this tree, take it down. The gardener says, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 you know, it, it, it'll be fine. Let me dig around it a little bit and put some fertilizer down on it. Now, you know what the fertilizer is, don't you? It's not a nice, clean chemical that comes from, in a bag from Lowe's. <laughs> in fact, if you've been 
driving around, you've been telling what the fertilizer is in most places around here. Well, that's what the farmer is saying. That he's saying, let me dig down and put some of that down into those roots and give it some, some food, even though it may not be pleasant. But it's food nonetheless, and we'll see next year if it bears fruit. Well, if that's what we need to do, sometimes we don't like the smell of it and we don't like the need to kind of take our spade or our pitchfork and make those holes in that ground. It's too much work. So we just sort of call ourselves Christians and, you know, we get baptized and we go on with our life. But for those early Christians, those first ones, it wasn't so simple because their life was in peril because they professed their faith in Christ Jesus. Their life was on the line. So to them, getting baptized was not a nice social convention. They had a nice party and a few gifts attached to it and a big celebration. You were taking your life into your hands by doing that. If we were in that situation, would we be professing our faith in Jesus Christ? Would we be willing to take those risks where somebody would come along and say, you're a believer, or would we be like Peter in the, in the story of the Passion? Well, uh, I, I never heard of the guy. Or would you say, no, I'm a believer? Okay, get in the paddy wagon. There are places in the world that are still like that, but not here, you see. And so consequently, when this whole notion of being buried with Christ and raised up to a new life, it's nice imagery, we like to talk about it a little bit, but it really doesn't cost us anything. Or not frequently, it doesn't cost us very much. And so we don't get too passionate about it. But you see, that's about the breathing, you see, because we breathe very shallowly. We just sort of take enough breath to get by rather than breathing deeply of the Spirit of God. One of the primary actions of this Spirit, then, that's given to us in baptism is to experience that kind of transformation where we're no longer afraid, but we're able to be changed and we are willing to profess our faith in Christ, regardless of the cost. That's a high price to pay. And yet, it is promised to us that the Spirit will speak only truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, Jesus says in John 16, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. Think of it again. This is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. So it is not just this kind of floating ghost out there somewhere, but it is the creative love of the Father. The God who was able to make the universe. This is the one who is speaking through the Spirit and speaking to us. It is, the, it is the, um, the saving love of the Son who, is, who believed in this so much that he would give up his own life just to show you how much God loves you. When the Spirit says, this is truth, it is that God that is speaking. And in Matthew 26, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's that serious that blood was shed to teach us the truth. Well, how do we know this then? That's the next promise that comes to us, is that the Spirit will help us to know God as we pray. Just Think of the little bit of change that came over you during our prayer this evening. Just simply being able to breathe. And that little bit of relaxation that came because of it. 
that little bit of calm that came into life, that was a transformation. That's not our normal way of acting, at least it's not mine. Usually I'm running 110 miles an hour. And most of us are worried about tomorrow or are upset about yesterday, and we forget about the now. We forget about this moment right here, right now. And sometimes we need to bring ourselves into that moment. And that's what the Spirit of God does. When we pray, if that's the way we pray, we will become deeper and deeper and deeper engaged by the Spirit, and it will get down into our roots. And when it gets into our roots, we can be changed. We can be transformed. That's what the Spirit does. And so Romans 8.26 promises us, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs, too deep for words. I don't know if you've ever had the experience. I know I've had it a few times in life where something just comes over you and it's so profound, you can't even talk about it. And all you do is you wail. Often it's when we've lost someone we love very deeply. And you just, the, the grief is so deep and so profound, you just, you, you just, it finally wells up and you just let it go. You wail. That's the way the Spirit prays. That's, because what is that? That is breath. So those groans that are deep within us, that move at the very root of our being, that's where the Spirit is working. And when we wail like that, often it brings transformation because we we finally get it out of our system and we, can, we just collapse. We become totally vulnerable to God and all of a sudden we realize we can pick up and go on. That, that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit binds us together in Christian community. We were all individually breathing. But whose air were you breathing? The person next to you. They let it go and you breathed it in. <laughs> Maybe not a pleasant thought, <laughs> but there it was. And then we sang. Remember we, at the very first one we said, St. Augustine taught us that when we sing we pray twice. But part of singing, part of why singing is so important for a community, why it's so important in our worship and in our prayer, is because we're all in the same place at the same time. All following the same meter, the same beat, saying the same syllable. Particularly if it's a unison kind of singing. If it's in parts, well, it all works together for a greater whole, but it's still all part of what it is. It becomes something marvelous and something big. It knits us into a community. That's how the spirit works. Whether it's breathing the air of the person next to you or singing together, that by that simple act, we are creating a community. We're creating a family. The very begin that's so important to Jesus, because right in the very beginning of Acts, after when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes, Acts tells us they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Because by their example, people said, I want that stuff. I want what you got. Uh, what is that movie? Harry and Sally. Remember that scene? It's the one that everybody remember. They're in the diner, and Sally's going through her motions. Okay. And what does the lady at the counter say? I'll have what she's having. 
it's the same thing with the, the community of Christians. That if we are living truly in the Spirit, the world outside sees that we are changed and transformed, and we're changed and transformed in such a way that it's just the nature of human beings. They're going to say, I want some of that. Now, whether they want to pay the price for it or not is another question. But the reality is that that's what is attractive. We want to add to our number, live in the Holy Spirit. We want to add to our number, commit our lives to Christ. We want to add to our number, live in this way, in this community. And it is God that will add to us because of that very core question, that hole that's deep inside of us, where people are looking for something important in our lives, in their lives, and they're going to see these people seem to have found it. Where, where did they get this? And they begin to ask questions. And they become inquirers. Ooh. <laughs> Finally, the Spirit promises to empower us to help others know Jesus. If we know Jesus, and we come to know Jesus ever more deeply in our own lives, the Holy Spirit is going to give us what we need to help others to come to know exactly what we know already. We don't have to worry. Jesus tells us that. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say or do. If we're really living in tune, in sync with that Spirit, it is it's the Spirit of God, and God is going to be doing the work. We're living the life of the Trinity. We're, we're being swept up in the life of the Godhead. We're being swept up into the life of God himself. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, we hear in the book of Acts. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So think about it. How is it that you respond to God's great love for you? Oh, we've talked about, you know, confessing our sins. We've talked about different ways of praying. But ultimately, it's about allowing God into your lives in such a way that you will allow God to change you. That's the hardest thing. That's the thing we're most afraid of. That afterward, we might be different than when we began because we grow comfortable and secure with what we know already, that letting go of what is in there for us, that becomes the hard part. And that's where the Spirit is important to us. See, so just because we're Episcopalians and we have the nickname God's Frozen Chosen, <laughs> does not mean that we don't already know or have the Holy Spirit. It may be a little harder to find from time to time. And maybe we don't go around speaking in tongues, and maybe we're not, you know, handling snakes, and we're not doing some of those things that we know other branches of, uh, of, of Christianity have done over the years to prove that the Holy Spirit of God... You know, in a lot of ways, that tempts God. Because you're saying, I, if I'm really with the Spirit, then I, you know, God's got to take care of me or else. Sometimes the or else comes because it's tempting God. We don't tempt God, it's the other way around. God tests us. And what God wants us to do is to have every confidence that the Spirit of God will live in our hearts. And as the Spirit of God lives in our hearts, these promises that we've talked about, they're listed on your, in your um, study guide, that they will be ours. These are promises. That means they're ours for the asking. They're not off to some distant place. They're already there. All we need to do is accept them. When someone gives you a gift, what do you do? You accept it and say, thank you. God is giving, has been giving us this gift from the beginning of time. When the Spirit of God, the breath of God, moved over the water. When the breath of God breathed life into that clump of clay and we became human beings. 
when God breathed life into defeated soldiers and they came back as a great army. When God breathed life into that son of his, Jesus, the chip off the old block, and showed us what love really is and what the demands of love really are, and that he's willing to do that for us, and so we must be willing to do the same for one another. If we do that, then this spirit, which is the same spirit, is ours. Doesn't need a special name. Doesn't need a special ceremony. Doesn't need a special test. The promises are there. All we need to do is finally accept. I don't like somebody giving me a new frying pan. Somebody gives me a new pot. What do I have to do? Cook dinner. <laughs> if I don't feel like cooking dinner, I may not want the pot. If I don't feel like being changed or transformed, I may push the gift of God away. But how much poorer are we for doing that? Because the very core of our life, we began with that. What is the meaning? What is the purpose of our life? If that's telling us, reach out. Reach out. Grab onto it. It's there. Just t it's there for the asking. Just take it. Take it. And you will be changed. That's what the Holy Spirit has got to do with us. That's who the Spirit is. And that's what the Holy Spirit's got to do with us. So next week, we're going to talk a little bit about the need, our need for the church. You know, we live in a world that says we don't need religion, we don't need institutions, that sort of thing. Well, maybe not. Maybe don't, we don't need the formalities, the, all the polity and all you know, the fancy duds, the pointy hats and the sticks and the rings and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we don't need all that stuff, but we do, I think. That's why we do it. But in essence, what we really need is to form this community we call the church. And so we're going to explore that a little bit next week, and that will bring our seven weeks to a conclusion. So I'm hoping that this, you take this home with you today. It's gotten a little esoteric, a little theoretical perhaps, but it's very real if we stop to think about it for a moment and start to look for it in your own life and see where the Spirit is alive.